Hello, today is April 1st, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we're privileged to have with us today Lawrence C. Foster. Welcome, Larry. Thanks for coming. Well, if I could ask you a few background questions, may I ask when and where you were born? I was born um, November 6, 1924, at my grandparent Taz home in Whitefield, Maine. And my grandmother delivered me. Really? Because my grandfather, Taz, was a farmer. And they didn't have a telephone then, and he didn't own a car. And um, when it was obviously that I was coming, he was sent to get the doctor. But by the time he got back with a horse and buggy and the doctor, my grandmother had already delivered me. But the doctor looked me over, I guess, and said, well, it looks like he'll make it all right. So he signed the birth certificate. And when I was six weeks old, we went back to Foxborough, Mass, where my father came from and where I've always lived. You grew up in Foxborough. Grew up in Foxborough. And still you currently live, live in Foxborough. Still live there. And what is your marital status? I'm married to a woman. We'll be married 64 years this December. And her name? Her name is Ida Elizabeth. And you have children? We have four children, three sons and a daughter. Any grandchildren? We have nine grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. Congratulations. That's remarkable. Big family. <laughs> That's great. Uh, when and where did you enter the military? I entered right after high school on July of 1942 at Newport, Rhode Island. Why? War was going on and my father was a, been a Navy man and my great-grandfather had been a Navy man in the Civil War and the Union. And uh, my uncle had been killed in the First World War in the Army and I decided I wasn't going to go in the Army, I'd go in the Navy. And your father, you said, was in the Navy also? My father was a Navy man. Did you have any friends uh, go with you Not or with sign me. up at the same time? Not with me, but a lot of us, a lot of my class, the class of 42, uh, most all the fellows went to war. Where were you sent for basic training? Newport, Rhode Island. And did they call it basic training in the, in the Navy uh, also? We called it boot camp. Boot camp. Yeah. What was that like? Well, it was like, I only was there for four weeks. I mean, they, they rushed us through. <laughs> they were in a hurry to get us someplace. Uh, I was, uh, it, was like, it was like a Boy Scout camp. I had been a Boy Scout and uh, had gone to camp, Boy Scout camp. So it was a, a lot like Boy Scout camp in a way. I mean, it was just all fellows and the same, you know, regulations, getting up early in the morning and doing this, doing that. Did they train you with anything specific? Not, no, basically no. Just uh, kind of get us into physical shape and uh, we took some, uh, I remember we took some tests of, see, I guess, whether we could talk, speak English, and so forth, and so on, and and if we, most of the fellows in my division were young like me, but there were some that were a little older who had some experience in other things. But of course, I didn't have any experience in anything, and um, I got picked to go to signal school. And the reason for that, I'm sure, was because as a Boy Scout, I knew uh, flag hoist and semaphore, and the Morse code, so they probably thought, well, this guy ought to be a signalman then. And what is semaphore? With the flags, flags. the alphabet. Okay. So you knew that, so you already had an advantage. I knew that from uh, Boy Scouts. So did you go t specifically to a different area of the camp? When I got, uh, no. When I got done training, most of it was just matching, learning how to fold up your uniform, knowing who to salute and what the different ranks were and so forth and so on. Uh, it was just kind of keeping us in physical shape. And I'd, we did some lessons about boats and lifeboats and how to put on a life jacket and so forth and so on, but uh, I don't recall that we did anything specifically. And a lot of matching, I know that, a lot of matching. So once you, they knew you could do the Morse code and the semaphore, um, becoming a signalman was your specialty? Yes, they and sent me to uh, Butler University out in Indianapolis where there was a signal school. How long were you there for? So I went there for four months. Had you ever been out into the Midwest before? I don't think I'd hardly ever been out of Foxborough before. Really? So this was sort <laughs> I'd of been down at the Cape a couple of times, but other than that, I'd never been to Foxborough. 
and out of Fox River Valley. Was this sort of an adventure for you? Do well, you remember, it was, uh, or was it school? It was sort of an adventure, I guess. And you were there for four months? Four months. And then from, from Signalman School, what did you do? Well, from there, and I don't know how they decided this, but they picked some of us and sent us to a school in Connecticut for a month to learn British uh, convoy signals. And um, I, I was a good student in school. Perhaps they thought I could, although I was only 17, but maybe they thought I could go by myself, because usually what happened in the AMGAD, most of the time, signalmen were the only signalmen on the ship, so you were by yourself all the time. There was a gun crew, but I mean, you didn't have anyone else to back you up. If you were sick or something, there wasn't another signalman on the ship, so you were the only one. So I got sent to that school for a month to learn British convoy signals. With the idea the, that... Well, then the I knew war. that I was going to be sent on convoy duty, but I didn't know really what kind of a ship it was. It turned out they were all merchant ships. I never did get on a, uh, any kind of a naval vessel during the war. So after your month in Connecticut, did they then put you on a ship? They sent me right to uh, New York, and I caught a Liberty ship out of New York, bound for Murmansk, Russia. Did you go with anyone else, or you were pretty much... I went by myself, but when I, I got assigned to the ship, there was a gun crew that had been assigned to the ship, as well as a naval officer. But I didn't know any of these fellows. I mean, I didn't come with them. Right. And you went to Russia. Well, we didn't get there, but uh, that's you where were we were bound for. Russia. Why didn't you get there? Well, because when we left uh, Loch U up in Scotland and headed around the Norwegian coast, we ran into the worst storm in the North Atlantic in about 50 years. It was so bad, it was the first time the British Admiralty released a weather report because it didn't matter. We had 70-foot ground swells. The what? convoy was all over the North Atlantic, and we had our flying bridge torn off, all of our deck cargo taken away, and we limped back into Scotland. And I heard later, which I don't know if this is all true, but only five tankers and a couple of fast destroyers made it through to Murmansk. And we had the uh, King George V, which was the battleship of the British home fleet, it turned back. It was so rough. We were about 70 miles off Trondenheim, Norway, which was a German naval base. And if that storm had stopped at that point, they could have probably come out and got us with a rowboat. <laughs> what was it like for you? You were young. You were in a storm that could conceivably take your life. What was it like? Uh, I think we were all so scared, really, that we just kept praying that the swells would slow down and that we would go back. But other than that, no one was seasick. No one was seasick? I think we were all too frightened to be seasick. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible feeling when you see these mountain waves in front of you and you wonder how your ship was going to make it over them. Now, you mentioned this was a Liberty ship. This was a Liberty Explain ship. Explain what a Liberty ship is. It was just the name of a cargo ship. Mm -hmm. They were built just to carry cargo. They carried a lot of cargo. Uh, they were cumbersome, you know. The top speed was about, I don't know, 10 knots maybe at the most. And uh, they called them ugly ducklings. They weren't, you know, they weren't streamlined or anything like that, but they were built to carry cargo. So you said you limped back into... Um, Scotland. Came back into Scotland. To repair and then the, the ship? They took all the cargo off there and uh, we went back to the States. How did you get back? Did on the same ship. On that ship. Yeah. And then With no bridge. We didn't, have, we didn't have part of our flying bridge, but that was all right. I mean, we could go back. And they put uh, earth in as ballast on the way back. We often thought when they cut down all the balloons over London that, that England would sink because they, we kept taking the earth back to the United States as ballast and then we threw it in the harbor on the way in and got rid of it because <laughs> we didn't bring any cargo back. So you had to have something, we had to, uh, something to wait uh, the ship, is yeah, that why? Yeah, okay. try to keep the ship in the water a little bit. So once you got back to the States... We came back, then uh, I caught another Liberty ship and uh, went back to sea again. So I spent all my time at sea, either on Liberty ships, seagoing tugs, or tankers. Talk about some of those experiences. What well, types of places did you go to? And it was to deliver cargo. Cargo. Or that was helpful to the war effort? 
everything was for the war effort. Mm -hmm. Tanks, uh, jeeps, uh, some of the ships, not my ship in particular, carried locomotives on them, on the decks, uh, food supplies, uh, I don't know what else was in there. I mean, you know, it was just big bulky cartons of stuff that was put in the holes or on the decks. So talk about some of the places that you went to to deliver these important Well, another items. interesting thing, I never went with anyone else that I sailed with on any particular ship. I mean, I, I got taken off and I would be behold on a ship with another completely new gun crew. The gun crews sometimes went together. They kind of stuck together at times. But signalmen, because I was only one, I never had another signalman go with me. On, on, once in a while, a radioman would go with us. But because it was radio silence and merchant ships had a radioman on, lots of times they just didn't need another radioman. You could, you could receive messages. You know, the ship could receive a few messages, but you couldn't send any. So you had to be pretty flexible about joining another group that I didn't, you didn't have any choice. Know. I got assigned. Yeah. And, and were I, you able to make friends, though, while you were on these? Well, I, I made friends, but, you know, um, you, you, I, I didn't write to any friends after I got off of one ship to another ship. I mean, how long, on average, would you be on one of the ships? And where did you tell us about some of the places you went to? Well, we went into southern. I went into uh, North Africa at one time, uh, and we brought back. Uh, uh, no, I went into southern France for us, and we carried a whole shipload of great big square cubes filled with air. They were to make bridges over the Rhine. But when we got there, they'd already got over the Rhine, so they threw them all out in the harbor. And later they went out and sank them all because they were becoming a navigational aid. And from there, I went back to North Africa and we brought French troops back. And we put them aboard like animals, to be honest with you. At night, they went into the holes where the cargo would have been and slept down in there and had guards on the top so they couldn't come out and show no light. Uh, were they most of them were, were seasick they? and everything else, but it was all while they were down there. They couldn't come out. They couldn't were go to the bathroom or anything while they were down there. So, But they were not prisoners. No, they were French troops, and we were bringing them back to France. To France. And, oh, were they glad to get back to France? Because these were the fellows that had left when France fell and went to North Africa with de Gaulle. So we hauled them back. Uh, I went down through the islands of Cuba, and Aruba. Uh, then I caught a tanker, uh, came back to the States, caught a tanker out of Bayonne, New Jersey. So what, what was the difference between a tanker and the cargo ships? That you well, a cargo was carrying dry cargo, basically. Mm -hmm. A tanker was carrying some kind of liquid, and most of the time, you know, it's either gasoline or crude oil or usually either crude oil or gasoline. So you grabbed a tanker? We went to uh, out of Bayonne, New Jersey, and uh, went down. We went to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we went to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. We went to Aruba quite a bit, loaded up, and then would go back to Cuba or, or and discharge our cargo there and go back. And last time we filled up we were heading for Belez, British Honduras, and that's when I got torpedoed. Your, sh your tanker got torpedoed. Yeah. Tell us about that day, and when was it? It was uh, November 23, 1943. I just turned 19 earlier in the month. On the 6th of November, I was 19. And um, we were running unescorted. And I always remember we had a chief engineer on the ship, and uh, he was really upset because he's, he kept saying, and we'd be back on the poop deck in the evening, batting the breeze, and he, he said, they shouldn't have sent us out alone. He says, I know we're gonna get torpedoed. He says, I know we're gonna get hit tonight. And everybody said, ah, we'll hit this old tub. <laughs> you know, it isn't worth sinking. But sure enough, we got hit that night. And um, I remember when I finally got into a lifeboat, there was a man hollering, pull me in, pull me in. So we pulled in the guy, it was the chief engineer. And we pulled him in. And uh, later, a lot of fellows smoked, and I didn't smoke at that time. And, um, and I didn't smoke much afterwards either. Uh, or they all wanted a cigarette. They all wanted a cigarette, you know, and nobody had any. 
He says, ah. he took off his watch cap. He had two packs of cigarettes and matches. He said, I told you we were going to get it tonight. And he said, I had my cigarettes with me. So where so, were yeah. you when you got hit? I had been sleeping up on the port side of the bridge because I was a signalman, and normally that's where I would be. And the quarters for the crew was back aft, and the quarters for the officers basically was up amidships, except sometimes an engineer would be back aft, and chief engineer lots of times would be back to make sure everything was going, and that's how he happened to be back aft at the time. And I slept out on a cot on the deck, and uh, it was a drizzly night, and I got tired of pulling the tap up over my head and then putting it down because I'd be suffocating underneath it after a while. And finally I went in and I said to the mate, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back aft and sleep in one of the gunner's sacks back aft. If you need me, you know, you know where I am. So he said, fine, go ahead, we're alone, and what would he need me for? Who would be signaling to us, and especially at night? So I went back aft, and, um, which was about 11 o'clock, crawled into a gunner's sack, and I did something that I, I don't ever remember doing it before or afterward. I took my life jacket off of the locker and I put it at the head of the bunk that night. And at 3.30 in the morning, that boat deck that I had been sleeping on, that's where they would put the torpedo right underneath it and blew the whole midships to smithereens. How many were lost? Uh, all of the officers up there were lost. Uh, I don't know how many, and quite a few of the merchant seamen were lost. And we lost two Navy gunners. So it's a miracle. Somebody was yes, watching out for you. I, I always believe God had a plan for me. What I don't was know what the like plan you, was, but... You were asleep. I was asleep. I didn't hear the torpedo go off, but as soon as I hit that deck, I knew we had been hit because the seams of the forecastle that I was in, it split open and we had flaming oil coming in there. And of course, we had wooden lockers. <laughs> and, uh, everything was on fire inside. I mean, you, you couldn't believe how fast everything caught on fire. Were there, there were alarms going off or? Anything? No, no. I, I don't remember anything going off. I mean, I, I guess you're in a state of shock. That's what it is. Well, I had never been torpedoed before, so of course I, you know. And uh, there were three other fellows in that forecastle with me, and it was an old, old tanker, and it had two exits out, because it ran a thought ship of, of the ship. Well, one of them, the doors jammed. One of them didn't have a doorknob on the outside, so nobody could pull that open, and the other one was jammed. And finally, one of the gunners and I, we just, well, in panic, and that's all it is, is panic. We kicked the door literally off and so we could tumble out onto the deck, you know, to get out of that forecastle. And we got out, everybody was running around, there was a lifeboat going over the side. I didn't get into that lifeboat because it was pretty well filled and there was one on the other side which I did get into and go down. The sub was off a little ways from us and they had a big searchlight on us for a few minutes watching. This was the German sub? German sub. That had hit you? torpedoed us, mm -hmm. and we were going in a big circle because what had happened, obviously, when we got hit, the helmsman had put the wheel hard to port, heading the bow towards the sub at that point. And uh, we were just going in a big circle, and the sub decided, I guess, to get out of the way and disappeared in the water. We were a little nervous because we had heard previous to that that sometimes they came alongside and that's why Columbia went to war and machine gunned the lifeboats. There was a fishing schooner out there that belonged to Columbia. They sank it and then machine gunned the lifeboats. So we were a little bit nervous about that, but they didn't, we didn't, never saw them again. So this, you said, was at 11 o'clock at night. 3.30 in the morning. 3.30 in the morning. Oh, you had gone. I had, had gone moved. back after, about 11 right. o'clock. So I had decided I, wasn't, I was tired of sleeping up there in the rain and one thing or another, so I went back after to sleep. When you're in the lifeboat, were you aware of your surroundings? Were you in, in a sh how were you feeling? Were you able to look and see what was happening to the tanker? Well, we could see there was just burning and a lot, a lot of smoke, black, heavy smoke and everything. And of course, we wanted to get away from the tanker. I mean, we didn't want to be run down by our own ship. But um, 
later, the next day, now the one lifeboat went down on the starboard side. We, I never saw that lifeboat again, but obviously they, they made it somehow. Somebody picked them up too. We were on the port side and there was a raft there with some fellows on it. So we stuck together. So in the morning, when we looked around, we were the only two things there, that our lifeboat and that raft. And didn't see the other lifeboats. They did all get picked up. We saw them in the hospital lab. They did get picked up, but we got separated at that so point. So how many were in your lifeboat? I couldn't tell you really. It was full. I mean, are you talking 20, 50? No, it was probably 15 or 18 of us. And then? And there was five or six fellows on the raft. But we got a line between the two of us so we could stay together rather than get separated because we figured it was a lot easier if there was two objects together to be spotted than one object at a time. And we had a mast up, but we didn't have any wind. It was cold at night. I got off in a pair of bathing trunks. It was the only thing I had on when I got torpedoed. And I had bought a nice pair of custom-made blues that I swore I'd eat before I'd lose them, but I didn't bother with them. They were in the locker. I never even thought about them. Did you have any kind of rations or anything? We had like some that? rations in the lifeboats, but to be honest with you, they, they weren't that good. The water was supposed to be changed every so often, but like a lot of, I guess, merchant ships, they didn't get changed on a regular basis. So, uh, But, you know, it was funny. I never drank a drop of water. I never was thirsty in the 36 hours I was out there. And other fellows were always thirsty. But, you know, some fellows were horribly burnt, though. Were they? And, I mean, they were in a lot of pain, and there was nothing we could do for them either. And some of them, of course, were dying for smoke. I wasn't. I didn't smoke, so it didn't bother me. But <laughs> the chief engineer had a few cigarettes, so that satisfied them for a while. So you mentioned you were out on the raft for 36... I was in the lifeboat. lifeboat and we had a raft I'm sorry, on. And the raft about, behind you. About 36, 36 hours before we got picked up. Hours. And talk about that. Prior to being picked up, did you see any other ships or Didn't any... see anything. Nothing, except nothing. the ocean. Just water. And hot during the day. And the only thing... I'm very fair-skinned, because I was a flaming redhead at that time. Uh, I would have been burnt to a crisp, but you know, with just the swim trunks on. But it was so covered with all this heavy fuel oil, black oil, that it all protected our skins and all. So we looked, you, when you got to shore, all, all you could see was the whites of our eyes, and it just, we're all black. Because you're all covered with the oil. All covered with this fuel oil, the explosions, everybody got, you know, it was like rain all over the place. So how did you get picked up? What happened? Well, when the plane spotted us, um, and it was he an dropped the package. Plane? The, it was a Navy plane. Navy plane. Yeah, yeah, PBY. He dropped the package, which we picked up. It had some uh, fresh water. Uh, it had some biscuits, and it had some hard chocolate. And the note said, uh, hang in there. Help is on the way. I remember that. He stayed with us for a little while, and then the big bomber came out. And they stayed with us until we got picked up. But I can see the guy today out the back hatch with his camera grinding, taking pictures, like the old, when you used to, well, I don't know about you, but when we used to go to the movies, they had the thing grinding to show what the events were going to be for the movie. I, I can remember that very clearly. And they were taking... And of course, everybody was waving and everything, you know, to make sure he saw us, and he saw us all right. He stayed with us until late in the evening, uh, just before dusk, a little uh, patrol craft came alongside and took us all aboard that and picked the fellows up on the raft and uh, sank the raft and sank the uh, lifeboat and uh, brought us into Panama. And um, I remember we came in Thanksgiving morning. And the other thing I remember is we had lieutenants down there. We came in like three or four o'clock in the morning, early in the morning, in white uniforms. and. Uh, and you're all covered in And I can oil. remember they were, they were picking us up and the uniforms were terrible. But they didn't mind. But they didn't mind. They took us to the ambulances and to the hospital. Were you injured? I was burnt, but other than that, I, the other thing that uh, was surprised me when I got in the hospital, we got weight. I had lost 28 pounds. Just in that period of time? Yeah, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and the medic said, hey, fella, you've had quite a shock to your system in case you don't know it. How long were you in the hospital for? About three weeks. 
Now, when you say you were burned, was it from the sun or was it the oil the, also? The oil in the legs, my legs, running through the fire. Yeah. Have you had any after effects from that since? The only thing I keep saying, and my feet are very sensitive to hot baths. Mm -hmm. My wife will say, I'll dry our bath for you, and I always tell you the water is too hot. She says it's fine for her, but you know it's too hot for me. So I, I think that's the only thing that bothers me is it's hot on my feet. So were you hospitalized in Panama? Yeah, at the Panama and Naval were Hospital. And your other the other, All the other guys you? were there, yeah. Were you all kind of putting the story together, or, or were you just... We were all more or less in the same wards, and so some of them were a lot more seriously burnt than I was, and they weren't in the same wards that I was on. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the merchantmen died afterwards in the hospital. They were burnt so badly they couldn't... Back then, there wasn't much they could do for them. So you were in for three weeks. Did you get discharged then, or did you have well, to Well, you back? know, I, I probably would have still been in Panama as far as the Navy was concerned, because now I want to get home, and I want to get back aboard ship again. I, I didn't want to stay there. And their attitude was, well, you know, if there was a ship going back. And, of course, you see, the problem was, I guess, they wasn't going to assign me to any Navy ship because I, I didn't serve on Navy ships. I was on merchant ships. So it was like, well, if some merchant ship happens to be going back to the States, uh, we'll see if we can get you a ride. But um, I could go ashore after I got out of the hospital, and I could go ashore, and they had a barracks that we stayed in. And um, so, you know, sailors, when they go ashore and they're away, someplace, the only place they can find to meet somebody else is in a, some bar room. I met another signalman on another ship. So uh, we got talking, and I said, uh, which way are you going? He says, oh, we're going back to the States. I said, oh, well, I want to go back to the States, too. I said, uh, do you think I can go back on your ship? I said, I'll stand watches. And he said, well, let me ask the captain of the merchant ship, and my uh, gunnery officer, to see, you know. So he met me the next night, and he said, yeah, they said if you, and the gunnery officer says, if you can stand watch, just, you can help me. Because usually that was the thing, a signalman, I was the only one, so I didn't have anybody to relieve me. So you'd spend all day on the watch, because there was nobody else to relieve you. It wasn't like the gun crew, they stood four and eight. <laughs> you know? but, um, and yours was mostly during the day, because during you the couldn't day, signal and Because there were really no night signals. Right. You know, there would be no night signals. So it would be just from early in the morning until, and usually didn't have signals early in the morning, especially if we were in a convoy, we were usually, unless it was an emergency. And usually you would know you were going to get that signal from the day before they would tell you that the next morning or something, there will be a change of course or something like that, and you'll get that signal. And is that what a lot of your signaling was? Course change? Change, course changes, you know, things of that nature. Anything else that was sort of unique? No, not particularly. Uh, sometimes we'd have a Commodore that would get very nitpicky about somebody wasn't keeping up speed or was out of line a little bit. There would be a message passed down for a certain ship to get back in line and so they'd or maintain pass to speed. You. Or, okay, so you would pass it to the uh, next and they'd pass it yeah. until that yeah. slow boat to wherever yeah, it was going. got yeah. the message. Yeah, yeah. I see. I see. And um, so uh, he said, um, sure, I'll stand watches. So uh, I went and told the Navy personnel, and they said, okay, if you've got a ship, so they signed me off, and I went back, and we went to um, Texas. And from there, I got a voucher to get me to New Orleans, which was where my base was. Your, it, was so, it a naval base? That, it was at New Orleans, a naval base mm -hmm. for the Iron Guard. And um, after that, from there, they gave me uh, two weeks and I went home for two weeks. To Foxborough? Mm-hmm. Took your, the train. Did your family know you? your, your uh, tanker had been I, They didn't torpedoed? know anything about it until I hit New Orleans, and then I wrote them a letter and told them I had been torpedoed, but I was all right, and I was on my way home. What was it like coming home for those two weeks? Oh, it was great. Do you remember doing anything special or just relaxing? Uh, well, I was glad to see my girlfriend. I was glad to see my folks and my younger brother, who was 10 years younger than I, and two sisters were younger than I was. Uh, my mother was happy. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, after your two weeks, what did you do? Went back to New Orleans? I went Orleans, back to New Orleans, and, and uh, I caught another ship. And I caught a... Um, 
as I recall, I caught a seagull and tug. And uh, we went up to Boston. <laughs> it was funny, I went from New Orleans back to Boston. And we had a big um, crane, floating crane on a badge. And at the time, it was the largest floating crane in the world. And uh, a big dump scow, like a great big flat boat that you put garbage and stuff in and they haul the sea and dump. I don't know if they do that anymore, but that's what they did then. And uh, we had them tow. We towed them down to um, Panama. And uh, hell getting through the canal because <laughs> they weren't very interested in a, in a tugboat with this big crane and this dump scow to get through the locks and everything but we finally got through and we towed it up to San Francisco and another uh, seagoing tug from the same company a big seagoing tug beautiful ships they were all new nice wheelhouses and everything and um, they took the dump uh, they took the crane and towed it to Guam for I don't know what they were doing out there but they took so the when you're on the tug how many others are on the tug with you do you think uh, we had a, a boatswain mate was our officer uh, we didn't have a commissioned officer and we had uh, I think we had eight Navy gunners we had a couple of uh, 50 caliber machine guns and a little uh, three inch gun so it was a very small crew, and not many in the merchant ship either. They were big, though, big tugs. They weren't like you'd see in a, they weren't a harbor tug. <laughs> right, right. And they were very, very powerful and very modern, nice modern. They had nice, I liked them. They had nice padded swivel chairs in the wheelhouse. You could sit up there and all curved and windshields, and you could see everything all around. But the tug was always, be, the tow was always behind us, and... Uh, any close all, calls on towing? No, not really. We always had to make sure we stayed well ahead and we didn't want the tow to, you know, because when you're towing something through the water like that, it does, you stop, it doesn't necessarily stop. It keeps coming. And the thing was huge, towered way over us, so we didn't want the thing to run into us. So. And it was rough going up uh, uh, Mexican, off the Mexican coast. It was very rough water. I mean, you, you, you're going just up and down, up and down, up and down. You don't roll. It's, it's pitching. And walking down passageways, you know, first you think you're climbing a mountain, next thing you're running down a hill, <laughs> especially in real rough weather. Tough eating in the mess hall, too. I mean, you have to hold your plates and things. But, uh, you know, you get used to it. I, I got seasick on my first trip, and uh, once in a while, and sometimes I'd get a little squeamish in, in rough weather, but uh, I never really got seasick after that. Going through the Panama Canal, was that... A fascination to you or just another? It was very fascinating and the thing that was interesting is um, we had to secure the guns. Uh, I don't know what they thought we were going to shoot somebody on the, <laughs> you know. And you could see uh, they had gun emplacements and you could see the gun emplacements and the barrels would follow you through the canal and pick you up to make sure if anything went wrong, I guess you were going to get it. In other words, they weren't going to give you a chance to I can't imagine it, but sabotage the locks or anything. They would blow you, I guess, right out of the locks for us. You weren't going to sabotage that canal, that's for sure, no matter who you were. So they really kept a, Every a lot of security. Every ship that went through, they, they tracked you with their own weapons mm -hmm. all the time. Who was overseeing the Panama Canal back then? We did. We did. But, uh, you know, it was a real lifeline. I mean, destroyers and, and cargo ships could go through. I mean, a battleship couldn't go through at that time, other carriers. But. After your tanker experience, did you have a different sense of security or lack of security after that, thinking it could happen again? Or Well, you, know, you never knew if it could happen again. But you were anxious to get continue on doing what you were doing. Well, I like, I like going to sea. I, I really enjoyed going to sea. Um, I sailed with one fellow who had been torpedoed twice the same day in the Mediterranean. And in fact, he was on a merchant ship and not one fellow on that merchant ship was killed in both torpedoings. And he got picked up by a British destroyer that got torpedoed. About two hours later, they figured it was from the same sub. Wow. 
but they all made it. That whole gun crew, not one of them got killed. That's amazing. Amazing. I don't know. Uh, we, we used to kid them and said, well, you must be crazy. You're out here again. You've been torpedoed twice in one day, and you're going to be out here again? One of the fellows that got torpedoed me would never went back to sea again. It he said he'd desert toll. before he'd go to sea. It just, you know, it just... He was married and a uh, young fellow, and uh, it just... But so he, as far as I know, he never went back. Uh, he stayed in the Navy and worked on bases and things, but never went back to see And him. they allowed that to happen. Well, I, I suppose he talked to somebody. Maybe they just thought, hey, this guy just isn't going to make it. I mean, you know, he could, I don't know what they thought. Maybe he'd have a nervous breakdown or something. How long did you stay in? I stayed in until 1945. The war was over. In fact, I, uh, I left India in November of 1945. Now, what brought you uh, to no, India? No, I'm, I'm wrong. I left India in August of 1945, and we hadn't been out very long when uh, one night they got me up because somebody, someone was flashing on the cloud, V, 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 all around. So I wonder, what was the signal? So I got up and uh, the only thing I can say, V is victory, the war must be over. I remember, of course, we can't break radio silence or anything. So a few hours later, they broke radio silence and the war was over. But I always said by the time I got back, which was late September, so were the parties. <laughs> but I had to stay in because I was in the regular Navy and my enlistment wasn't up until November 6th. But I didn't get discharged until November 11th. I had a few guys convinced that they were paying me time and a half because I was over my regular enlistment, but fat chance. But you were back and forth to all of these different areas prior to the end of the war, and you were actually in India? India. Went to India. Went around the world. Were you on a tanker, or were you on No, a I was on a great big, uh, fact, um, when I had that seagoing tug and went to San Francisco, they took me off and sent me to San Diego. And at San Diego, I picked up a uh, victory ship, which was the latest thing, you know, like two steps up from the, the Liberty ship. And they were really very, very modern and nice and carried a lot of cargo. And uh, I often wondered about this, too. Um, we carried a, a cube of gold, a regular cube built in the number three hatch that was full of gold bullion to back up the Indian currency and whiskey and cigarettes for the troops. And we had lieutenant colonels and majors with machine guns standing guard at that cubicle until we cleared port, and then they got off with the pilot. Where? Well, in the San Diego. And we had a naval attache going to Australia, and he went with us. We had to go all the way down to Australia and let him off, and we stayed there one day. I did get ashore in Australia for a few hours, and then we went under Australia and all the way back up into India to Calcutta to deliver the the gold and the, and the cigarettes, and that's all we had on the ship, cigarettes and uh, whiskey and gold. And we loaded up with uh, hemp on the way back. We brought a whole cargo back of hemp from India back to the States, up through the Suez Canal. And was there any chat through. about the gold and what it was being used for? No, it was just to back up the currency or something. I, I don't know, it was gold, uh, you know, blocks. I don't know how many was there, but they had that, and in there they also had uh, uh, whiskey and uh, well, cargo we carried was whiskey and cigarettes, basically. That's all we carried for all the troops over there. So you saw the V, what you assumed was victory sign. Yeah, and a few and hours later the radio silence was broken and the war was over. How did everybody feel about that? Did oh, we were all glad it was over. Mm -hmm. So then did you come back to the we States? We didn't know, uh, you know, we didn't... We didn't get a lot of news as to what was going on in other places. You know, most of the news we got when we got into port. We didn't get a lot of news. Uh, sometimes we'd get some news broadcast that we could receive, but we couldn't send anything. And it'd say they were doing this or they're doing that or they landed here or they landed there. But we were kind of isolated really, in a way. Having been wounded, um, because of the tanker mishap, did you get any kind of special recognition for that? Uh, no, I got a Purple Heart, but which I well, that's special. I didn't. I wasn't. 
Uh, I guess I didn't realize that you got a purple hat for wounds. I thought, I guess, you know, I was a kid. I Kind of naive. I guess I thought you had to be shot by a bullet or something, then you got a purple hat. But I didn't realize that you got it just because you got burnt, but it was because you got wounded as a result of enemy action. And what was the name of the tanker that got um, torpedoed. Bo torpedoed? It was the SS Elizabeth Kellogg. And then you went from there to the hospital. What, what was the quality of medical care that you think? Oh, it was good. You know, like, you know, they plain. Well, I know you got a couple of weeks off when you came home from that. Did you get any other time off? You had mentioned like a day here or a day here uh, in port, but did you get any other Sometimes when time? we used to come into Boston, when I, in fact, I caught the tug, I came into Boston, uh, I could go home every night and, you know, for the day and I had to report back the next day. I could go home like in the afternoon. I'd take the train to Mansfield and then, then we had buses running to Foxborough and I could go home. But uh, I'd have to be back the next morning. And um, in fact, I almost missed that ship in Boston because uh, <laughs> uh, my girlfriend said to me, oh, well, can't you stay another day? And I said, no, I, I can't stay another day. I have to go, you know. But she said, well, come down to the house before you go. And I said, well, I'm not sure. And I decided I wouldn't, and I didn't. And it was a good thing because I just made the ship. The ship was leaving. Did some not come back, and were they considered No, everyone was there, because I was the only one from, that lived in Massachusetts. The rest of the crew, they didn't come from anywhere around there. I never sailed with many fellows from Massachusetts, except um, on the tanker there was a couple of fellows that came from Massachusetts. One lived in Worcester. He's the one that wouldn't go back to sea again. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see him I after? I never saw him again. With all of these places that you went to that you had never been to before. You had mentioned North Africa, India, Cuba, Aruba, Puerto Rico. Any fascinations with any of them that made you want to think about going back again in Well, I went pleasure? into Marseille, France, which was an interesting place. And uh, I never thought much about it till I got there. Then I realized my uncle was buried in France from the First World War. And um, so I thought, well, sometime I'd like to go back to France and um, you go to the cemetery where he was buried, and it, we did go back to France. Uh, one time my wife and I went to England, and then we went to France, and I did find the cemetery. Although when I got down in the, it was more down in the southern area, when you talk to a Frenchman about the cemetery, the only thing they think of is Verdun. Verdun is a big national cemetery, but I didn't want Verdun. I wanted the cemetery where my uncle, where Americans were buried. And you found it? I found it, and when I went there, it was interesting because I said to the, they had Italian, uh, American, overseers there, but they had, um, the French took care of the grounds and everything, and every year they brought in Italians, and they had beautiful white uh, marble crosses, and they cleaned them, and I said to the fellow, you know, I remember pictures of my grandmother going when the Gold Star Mothers went, and they were wooden crosses, and I said, the other thing I remember, my grandmother kneeling at her son's grave, and there were crosses on both sides of my uncle's grave, but now there's no crosses on the right. He said, you're right. He said, when Herbert Hoover uh, paid, or the government paid, but he was the president, when all the Gold Star mothers in the United States could go to France to visit their son's graves, and my grandmother went. He said, after that, so a lot of them decided they'd bring the boys home. So they had to reorganize the cemetery and that's why he said there's no cross on the right of your uncle's grave now, because a lot of the bodies were removed, and when they Take reorganized it, he happened to be left, but she left him there. So when you came home, what did you do? How old, 19, almost 20 when I came out, I was, tw I was uh, 21 when I came out. When you came out. Because I got discharged, as I say, just shortly after my 21st birthday. I was supposed to be out on November 6th, but I didn't get discharged until November 11th. In 1945. 1945. And what was your rank at that time? I was a signalman first class. Coming home, what was it like? How, how did you feel? Well, it's, uh, you know, Foxborough hadn't changed that much. I mean, there was a few fellows that didn't make it back, so that was a change. But most all of us made it back, and um, the town hadn't changed much, really. 
Foxborough. Foxborough in itself hadn't changed much, really. So I wound up going to work for the Foxborough Company. And what is the Foxborough Company? It was a maker of uh, big uh, industrial instrumentation. How long did you stay with them? Um, I stayed with them for about 28 years. Uh, I wound up eventually, as while I was there, I wound up as a foreman of one of their big final assembly departments. And then I went into the real estate business. In the Foxborough area? In the Foxborough area. Did I worked you... for a Century 21 agency. Did you utilize any of the GI benefits after the war for school or medical or anything like no. that? No. Did you join any military reserve? I was in the Naval Reserve for about 12 years after the war. That's how I got those pictures. Uh, one of the we had a, uh, an inspection at Brockton for the Commandant. Uh, the Navy came out, you know, an annual and dress inspection. And um, most everyone there was, uh, the petty officers were all fellows that had served in the war. But most everybody in their reserves there were high school kids in Brockton. And they joined the reserves, and then they could go in the Navy. And uh, so we had to dress with our ribbons and dress uniforms. And one of the fellows, uh, one of the kids asked me, well, what was this? Uh, it was my purple hat. So I told him, well, I'd been torpedoed on a tanker down the Caribbean and got burned and I got a purple hat out of it. I didn't think much more about that. Well, he came in a couple of months later, and he had a magazine that he had picked up in the Brockton Library. And he said, I thought you'd be interested in this. And uh, it was about sinkings in the Caribbean. So I said, oh, yeah. So I opened it up. And when I opened it up, the first picture I saw was a picture of the uh, lifeboat and the raft. And underneath it said, survivors of the SS Elizabeth Kellogg. I says, I'm in that lifeboat. So I sent to, uh, there was an address there. And I sent to them. And they referred me to someone else. And I forget now who it was. but. That's how I got the photographs. So you actually have photos of you in the lifeboat. And that's photos, that's, that's ones that you have. Those are the ones. That's how I got them, which was years after the war. I'm not sure these. And are I remember up. now the the big bomber. The guy was taking all the pictures, and that's where those pictures came from. From the man in the uh, airplane. Yeah. I don't know if they can. And that's where those pictures. Up. That's where those you pictures came from. Show them to the camera. See if Dan can pick up. That's the uh, tanker. And there's... And I'm in the lifeboat back here somewhere. There's I can't there. identify myself. And this is the raft we had in tow behind yeah. us. Hold it up a little bit. Yeah. Perfect. And, and show the tanker again, too. And this is one view of the tanker. Split in three, two areas, isn't it? And this was the other view of the tanker. Obviously, the plane must have been flying right over it, practically, right. and looking right down at it. You can see, you can see how the midship, how its, its back is broken. And uh, what happened is it burns itself out. And then, of course, when the, all the fuel is burnt out, the water takes its place and it fills it up and it sinks. And it sinks. Yeah. But that's how I, got, that's how I found, got the pictures, which was... That's quite a story. Kind of an accident. Sure. You know, it just happened that this kid happened to be picked up a magazine in the Brockton Library. And Did you join any... Veterans organizations. I did join the American Legion uh, for quite a while uh, because of the fact the Legion Post in Fox was named for my uncle. Really? Because he was the youngest boy from Foxborough killed in the, in the First World War. And um, uh, I stayed in it for quite a while, and, uh, but then I had, I don't know, other things. That, that kept you busy? Later, they uh, put a, a, a bar in the uh, Legion post. Uh, I don't think I was in it at that time, but I know if my grandmother had been alive, she'd have gone up there and taken her son's name right off of the post. Because of the bar. Because of the drinking. <laughs> Do you attend, or have you ever attended any reunions of your any of your groups? No, because um, we weren't. Uh, you know, I never was assigned with anyone any real length of time. None of us were at that time. It wasn't like some fellows they serve on a destroyer, but you might be on that destroyer for two or three years. You know, that'd be your duty station all the time, unless they blew it out of the water. But in the armed guard, you were just 
jerked off of one ship and put on another one, maybe it was only a week in between and you were off to sea again with a whole new gun crew. Wherever you were needed. Yeah, wherever you were needed, so. How important to you was serving in the Navy? What's that? How important was it to you to serve in the military, in the Navy? Well, I wanted to, my country was at war, so like all young kids, I guess, most all of them, they were going to go out and lick the enemy, you know, and, and my father had been in the Navy, and so I, and I guess I didn't want to go in the Army. <laughs> Do you feel it affected your life in any way? Um, well, sometimes I think all the wars we've been in since, we shouldn't have been there. Looking back, I wonder what, what has it proved? We still have men in Korea. We still have men in Germany. We still have men, you know, what, what has it proved except the loss of life? And it's, I'm not an isolationist, but I, I, I think that my feeling has been lately even more so is we'll meet them on the shore if they want to come over here. Let them come, we'll meet them on the beaches. And I think we'd, uh, I really think you'd have a united America. I think we have a split sometimes in our country. And the only ones that are concerned about the wars are the ones whose sons are over there, or husbands. The rest say, oh, it's awful, but it doesn't affect me, so my life goes on. That's a terrible waste of life. And, you know, I look back and look at the wars we fought since the Second World War. What has it proved? Having oh, that's only my opinion. I'm sure a lot of people have got other good reasons why we're supposed to be there, but... That's a good opinion to have also. What's that? That's a good opinion to have, yeah. having experienced what you've experienced, don't you think? Yeah, and I have three sons, and um, one son served in the Navy. Uh, was, he, frankly, he didn't want to get drafted, and I didn't want him to get drafted, so he went in the Navy. Another son served in the Navy and served 20 years and retired as a senior chief petty officer. I loved every day of it. Served three years in the Army and hated every day of it. Then joined the Navy and served 20 years and loved every day of it. So it's in the, it's in the foster blood, I guess. Yeah, well, and he say. served most of it, uh, it's interesting, he served most of this time in the Med and in the Persian Gulf on uh, small uh, guided missile frigates, they called them. But he was discharged, his last duty station was on the um, carrier, the George Washington, and that's where he was discharged from. Having seen so many areas during the war, did you get the travel bug at all? Did you continue to travel after you came uh, home? My wife and I have traveled, well, quite extensively, I guess. Uh, we've been to Greece and the islands. Uh, uh, we made one stop on the tour of the islands. We stopped in Turkey to Ephesus, where Paul preached. Uh, we went uh, one time for a month to the British Isles. Another time we went for six weeks to France, Switzerland, Portugal, and the British Isles. We've traveled in every state in the United States. And she's been to Alaska. I haven't, except to Hawaii. I told her I saw enough cold water and ice cubes and everything else in the North Atlantic, I wasn't going to go pay to look at some more of it. <laughs> so she went with her sister, who was a Navy nurse. Really? Yeah. Ha have you ever been back to Aruba? You had spent some time no. down there. No. Any this, uh, It's changed a lot. When I was there, it, it smelled. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had an oil refinery there, and it wasn't, and it wasn't, it wasn't really much there. Above all is Except there... Except barrooms. Sure. Yeah. You know, and I went into a few of them too, but uh, I, I somehow I, I, I got drunk a couple of times and I, a big head bothered me and after that I decided it just wasn't worth it. I didn't mind going and having a couple of beers, but that was it. The rum gets you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't used to rum. And, you, know, you get a couple of them shots of rum and your head throbs for two days afterwards, or at least mine did. When you came home, did you talk at all about your experience, or did you just... Not much, I tell you. It wasn't any different from what everybody else had. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys had a lot worse experience than I had being torpedoed. Is there one thought or incident you'd like to share with your family or others who might see this tape? I didn't hear what you said. 
Is there a thought or an incident or anything that you would like to share with us and with your family, others who might see this tape? Anything you'd like to say? Well, I guess uh, it's the old uh, expression. I think it was uh, Stephen Decatur, who was one of our naval heroes, um, my country right or wrong. Well, we can't thank you enough, Lawrence C. Foster, Larry Foster. Yeah. Thank you so much for well, coming in and telling to, the story. That I think these stories, mine wasn't spectacular, but there are a lot of stories that should be passed down to future generations. Well, we appreciate your taking the time to do this. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.